Hello everyone! Low back pain is one of the most heard complaints from any patients. Almost every adult now is complaining of low back pain. One of the most common causes of low back pain is slipped or herniated disc. Our role today is to answer most of your questions regarding intervertebral hernia. Today we have Dr. Un, who is a leading doctor at Uritel Hospital in Kanna. He is going to discuss with us everything about intervertebral hernia from an experienced medical point of view. I'm Uma, before we start, please subscribe to our channel so the next time you'll be updated with our new releases. Hello, Dr. Um. Nice Hello. to meet you. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you for giving us time today. We came with some frequently asked questions and mm. we'd like to ask you about this. So to start with intervertebral hernia, can you please explain a little bit about it? We often call it a disc, but the correct term is originally a herniated disc. In our spine, there is a disc between the bones, and as the disc ages and force is applied, the outer surface is torn, and we call that a tear in the annulus fibrous. Below that, a piece of the disc leaks out and presses on the nerve behind it, and this disease is called herniated disc. So usually what are the symptoms for this disease? First of all, it can be divided into two. The first is the sensory, the sensory problem. The sensation is usually presented as pain. The hips, thighs, calves, and legs feel numb and sore. It feels stingy, and many describe the sensation as electricity flowing through. This pain can be followed by numbness of the sensation. However, the next thing that can come is the limitation of movement. Since this spinal nerve moves the senses and muscles of our body, if the nerve is pressed hard, the leg will not move. For example, the toe will not rise and the ankle will not rise. Such paralysis can occur. I heard that there are some types of hernia. What are the usually types or the types that people usually know? The most common is to differentiate the discs in terms of location. There is a vertebral canal, and there is a disc that protrudes inside, and a disc that flows out of the vertebral canal. Also, depending on the shape, it could be expressed as up-migrated or down-migrated. So, in the case of somebody who thinks he has hernia, how can you diagnose that this person has hernia or not? First of all, when looking at a patient, if the patient talks about numbness and neuralgia that leads to the hip, thigh, and calf from top to bottom, then a disc is suspected. MRI and CT are available imaging tests. Are there some certain factors that we should look for that could provoke hernia in some cases? Discs can occur with old age or young students, 12 or 18 years old. The reason being trauma or congenital weakness of the disc. A back injury, sprain, or even coughing hard can cause a disease to tear and pop out, which can make these discs suddenly worse. So it's related to age? Older people are more likely to develop a herniated disc, but this is not always the case as it always occurs in young people. In a way, a situation in which force is applied, strain and stress are repeated, can worsen the disc. In such situations, especially when we do something with our back bent, lift something heavy, or work that puts a lot of stress on the disc itself, the disc can become bad. So how about the treatments? We start step by step, of course. If it hurts at first, we can prescribe pain relievers and NSAIDs. And physical therapy, hot baths, and warm showers are also helpful. However, if this does not control the pain to some extent, CT or MRI is done to see where the disc is located. And then an injection is placed there. This is called a spinal nerve root block, which is a treatment that places a needle near the disc and then sprays a steroid solution to reduce the inflammation and swelling around the disc and nerve, making it less painful. After receiving this treatment once or twice, seven or eight out of ten patients usually get better. 
If there are patients who do not get better with it, surgery can be chosen as the next step. There is a middle stage between surgery and injection that we call a procedure. Representative examples of this are neuroplasty, in other words, neuroadhesion, dissection, tailbone surgery, neuralysis, neuroplasty, etc. This is a treatment in which local anesthesia is performed and a thin catheter is inserted into the tailbone, which peels the adhesions around the nerve and gives an injection. So it is a very simple treatment that does not require general anesthesia. And even after the procedure, if the patient's symptoms hip and leg strengthen, or pain or discomfort in life continue, then surgery can be performed. The most common surgery is general anesthesia, an incision while looking at the microscope. If you want to go a little bit more minimally invasive than that, there is a surgical method that uses a spinal endoscope. So going back to the treatments, you said that not all surgery needs, not all uh, cases need surgery. So what are the cases that actually need surgery from the beginning? There are two cases where people are told to do the surgery right from the beginning, and that's when the patient visits the hospital due to paralysis. If they are limping, and when asking what is wrong, if they say their ankle or toe does not move up, you can think of it as a situation where emergency surgery needs to be performed immediately without going through a period of conservative treatment such as injection or drug treatment, as mentioned earlier. Something similar to this is Kana Equina syndrome, which means paralysis in the perineum, an anal area. Also, if they're in a situation where they can't control their bowel movements, then this means they require surgery right away. Secondly, we subjectively choose surgery. Some patients are in extreme pain. For example, they can't even get out of bed, so an ambulance is called to carry them, and some can't stand or sit down at work or sleep at night. We call this extreme pain, and if you have such pain, you must consider it immediate surgery. So this is a question that many people are curious about. Are there any ways to prevent hernia from the beginning? It would be important to pay attention to your lower back on a regular basis and not to engage in postures and movements that can cause a herniated disc. If we look at it this way, we must understand one thing. We call stretching our back straight lordosis, and this curved position kythosis. In this kythosis position, the pressure on the disc increases. That's why you should avoid doing movements in this kythosis position. For example, while we exercise, sit-ups, bending the back, or bending the back to lift heavy things, or doing various things by bending them, etc. Increase the pressure on the disc and tear the back of the disc, which can cause a herniated disc. It's best to avoid these kinds of actions. Another thing I want to say is that sitting for a long time is not good for your back. But you know, these days people keep sitting in their office desks. So is there any good posture they should follow? As I mentioned before, even if you are sitting, rather than sitting in a cathodic position, a posture that straightens your back a little will put less pressure on the disc. Even more importantly, even if you have to sit for a long time, get up every 30 minutes or an hour and walk for 3 to 5 minutes so that your back muscles and disc are less strained. Today we learned many things about intervertebral hernia in detail, such as its symptoms, treatments. Thank you for joining us once again today at Cloud Hospital TV. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and we'll respond to you as soon as possible.